Hi everyone, I want to talk a little bit today about how I develop composition and how I go from ideas through to fruition in paintings and what I want to particularly talk about today is a painting I'm developing at the moment so I haven't actually even started this yet um, but I wanted to show as much of the process of how I do that as I could and a friend of mine has been in touch with me recently and his mother is moving out of what was the family home uh, because, you know, my friend is in his 30s, his younger sister is a couple of years younger, mother doesn't really need a large house on her own anymore, so she's downsizing. And because they had many happy years there, um, he asked me to paint the family home for them as a present for her for Christmas, which I'm you know, quite happy to do. That's a nice idea. And I'm going to do it for free because it's a present for a friend. And I looked at their family home, which is a terraced house in the UK. And terraced houses are kind of like row houses in the USA. I know from my statistics that 90% of my viewers are uh, women between 30 and 60 in the USA. So uh, forgive me for adding the occasional cultural explanation because I know that not everyone is au fait with the way the UK is arranged. And um, the Victorians built these houses. Um, they originally had terraced houses that were called back-to-backs where the back of one house was the back of the next house. There was nothing between them. So there'd be two, two parallel streets and the houses would kind of fill the gaps. And then later in the Victorian era, they built slightly higher value um, terraced houses. And this is an end terrace house, so it's the end of a, of a row of houses. Um, but these have now gentrified across virtually the whole UK, and actually they sell for a hell of a lot of money. And they've usually got these days, I mean, this is not how they were when they were originally built, but they would usually have between three and four bedrooms. And bear in mind... US viewers that our houses in the UK are tiny compared to what you guys are used to because we live on a very small wet island and we don't have a lot of space so our rooms are very small we don't have ensuite bedrooms typically uh, or if we do it would be one bedroom ensuite and the rest share a bathroom so our houses are very different and I uh, just wanted to kind of explain that so I haven't got a photo of it in front of me because I don't want to show a photo of someone's home, really, on, on the internet. I don't think that's really very fair. And their house is painted white, but the surrounding houses are the original brown um, brick. And the houses opposite are also brown brick, which means the light reflected on the white house is a little bit grey. So I wanted to take artistic licence with that and mess with it. Their house is on a little road... The end of the road is a huge park, so I figured I could kind of move some trees so that there's green light reflected on the house, and that would be pretty. And I showed a variety of styles to my friend, and he thought that the very loose impressionist style, which is what I really like painting the most, actually, would suit this best. So I've done a really small sketch just for myself to remind me of the shapes rather than anything else. This is not intended to be anything like reality. It's just to remind myself the morphology of the house, and then you've got the house adjacent. I've missed the roof off the adjacent houses for some strange reason. Don't really know why I did that. Let's get some better focus here. And the trees that I've added behind don't really exist. This gate here is in a kind of light red, Venetian red kind of colour in real life and I've added these trees in a bit closer and what I thought would be a really cool way of painting this would be to actually not paint the house and just mask out the area of the house throw paint on the page to represent all these other things like the gate and the, and the trees then unmask the house and just paint in the windows and that's probably what I'm going to do but I want to test out some ideas so I was going to colour this in with coloured pencils just as a reminder to myself of which bits are which colour. The door and the windows are not really purple, that was just me wanting to use the purple ink tense pencil because I haven't used it. So I've just painted it in, uh, by well just sort of sketched in using the ink tense outliner pencil which is a non-soluble pencil and to be honest is a complete rip off because you could just use any old pencil. So don't buy that, don't buy outliner 2400, any kind of... Um, H or F grade pencil, the really sharp ones that don't have a lot of kind of clay stuff in them, won't smear when you get them wet, so you could just use that. I don't really know why I decided to buy that, but there you go. I used, just so that anyone watching who cares knows the colours, I used 1910 red oxide for the little gate, 
which is probably fairly accurate. I used Willow in the ink tents blocks to do all of the brown areas. And then the trees and so on were uh, leaf green and sherbet lemon, which is a wonderful acid yellow. And then the um, purple doors and windows are 071, sorry, 0720 Thistle. And they're all in the Derwent Ink Tents pencils range. And then I just used the Kalinsky Sable um, size 4 round from Winter and Newton just to kind of spread that around a bit. I haven't really used my ink tents much um, having since buying them, which is why I thought I really had an opportunity here to just play with them. And I realised what you, the real trick is, is to use as little water as possible. So there's my little tip for people. Um, I'm probably not going to use them quite so much um, now, I don't, or, or in this particular piece of work. But I wanted to explore composition and the process that I kind of go through, because I do maintain quite a detailed sketchbook. I annotate my ideas, uh, so I can I can use them again. So if this idea doesn't work. In three years' time, when I'm painting a daisy, and I think, oh, I could paint it as a negative image, I can go back and see what I tried out. So, we'll see. should add, it's absolutely pouring with rain today, and um, that's why I'm indoors doing a kind of Spin Doctor Sits video. And this is a Spin Doctor Sits and Composes video. So, um, be warned, there may not be the most polite of language, because I am going to apologise to everybody in advance here. I don't even think when I'm not in polite company that I shouldn't swear. It just, it just doesn't cross my mind. So it just comes out and I can't stop myself and I don't edit these videos. So there you go. Um, a friend of mine, a colleague uh, who worked in the USA, she worked in New Orleans for most of the 1990s as a waitress. She's from Glasgow and um, anyone who knows Glasgow will know it's a quite a tough city. And she was from a part of that city where it's mostly dock workers sailors and uh, she learned some pretty fruity language and when she was working in the USA a girl actually said to her an American girl she was working with actually said to her you know were you raised in an orphanage do you have parents because your language is absolutely the most disgusting I've ever heard and I don't think she's as bad as me so uh, I'm on best behavior when I do these videos really I am so what I thought I'd do is try out this sort of masking of the shape and then um seeing how it goes. So the first thing I want to do, I transferred this shape by measuring from the uh, the actual street view image that I was sent and I just want to annotate it um, with the actual uh, ratio of the house because I want to maintain that when I expand it and I'm not actually going to start the actual painting today the actual painting oops we're out of focus I'm so sorry the actual painting will be done on Arsh most likely or Milford because I want to use translucent or transparent watercolors I should say and I want to use a very very hard size paper like Milford because if you use transparent watercolors on it you get a much brighter more luminous effect because they don't soak into the paper fibers at all they sit around the paper fibers and if you watch my video that I will link in the iCards right now of my review of Milford versus Waterford versus Bockingford, you will see that it is really striking how bright and vivid it looks. And the other advantage of Milford is it everything lifts so easily. Um, I lifted even some of the most staining colours, which if you watch my video in the iCards, on things that stain and things that don't, and you'll remember that it's thalocyanines, quinacridones, and reds stain, PQRS. Um, thalo blue, quinacridone magenta, lifted 48 hours later, 100% on that paper, which really impressed me. It's a 100% cotton paper as well, and I find cotton papers tend to stain depending on their sizing, but uh, one with the same size as a wood paper or a chemical pulp paper, for me, will stain exactly, um, will stain far worse than a wood paper or chemical pulp paper, I should say. And as always, while I'm doing this, I'll be talking about what's coming up on my channel. And if there's anything that you're interested in seeing, or you'd like me to try out, or you'd like me to review, please put it in the comments because, um, I, I use that. Um, I, my last couple of 101 videos 
my gouache 101 and my watercolour paper 101 have come from people requesting them here and in other locations. So please do, um, please do comment. So what I'm probably going to use to actually try this out, um, I don't think I'm actually going to sketch out anything yet. I'm going to come back to my sketchbook. What I'm going to do instead is um, start working on some paper. So this is Bockingford... 425 GSM, which I think is £250, maybe 200 I think it's £200 or £250, but it's one of the pretty stiff ones. And I'm not going to bother stretching it because this is a sketch. And if you can see, the bottom is diagonal because I cut this myself from an imperial sheet. It's actually an offcut um, from something else I was painting. So I'll just get an idea of the morphology of it. It's 12 inches by... just under nine and a half inches and because I'm painting a house there comes the question of do I do a portrait house with not much stuff around it or do I landscape house with lots of stuff around it and um, because I'm mostly painting the stuff around it and not really the house um, and I'm going to want to leave some space for mounting um, I think landscape is going to be better now I've talked to my friend already and he agreed that there was no sense in doing anything bigger than about A3 as we would say, which is double A4 in the UK, at once in a frame because she's moving somewhere small and she won't have anywhere to put it. So I've just ruled roughly one inch in using a Derwent watercolour pencil I think or a colour soft pencil in ivory black i think it's a watercolor pencil let's just check that if it because if it's going to dissolve i want to know so i can just avoid it yeah that's a watercolor pencil so that's fine i mean this is a sketch this is part of the composition process this is so i can work out for me does this technique really work now what i'm going to use as my mask rather than gallons of masking fluid is some transparency and I'm going to tape it down. So I measured before that it was one and a quarter inches high by one inch wide. So I've got a one to 1.25 ratio that I need to achieve. And because the house is has a roof, it can't be any taller than that. So it can't be taller than that distance because it's got to have its roof. And I want room for the trees, of course. So I want to actually have it kind of in the middle so it's got some foreground as well and the roof will take it up to about here and then the trees will make up the walls of the house i may even remove the roof i don't know i may even remove the, the actual roof and and actually move the house up and do it as though it's kind of blurring away into the background on all four sides not quite sure yet so i think i'm probably not going to cut this smaller than or larger than a certain size so let's have a look here I think first of all I might do about five inches in that direction and now I need to divide that by five and multiply it by four to get the other direction which of course gives me four inches so I want a five inch by four inch and I've got my permanent pen that paints on writes on overhead projector transparency because it is actually an overhead transparency pen from the good old days where we still use them and i'm not being careful um if i was doing this you know for the real thing i would be using a t-ruler and i would not be doing it on a diagonal angle and i certainly wouldn't be talking to you as you know, much as i love you wouldn't be talking to you sat there in your underwear watching YouTube at three o'clock in the morning because you can't sleep. That's probably just me. And I could do this with masking paper. I could do this with just a load of tape. Um, I could do it by cutting a stencil um, and cut uh, like a, a, a reverse stencil out of stencil paper. And what I find good for stencils, someone asked me, is there is a, I've not actually used it much. I've tried, I bought some and I tried it. There is a waxed manila stencil paper that you can get that actually I think is pretty good. So I've cut just a rough piece of acetate there and I'm going to position it pretty roughly. I mean, this is not even lying flat at the moment, so that's how careful I'm being. And let's see if I can find the tape. There it is. I buy really crap artist's loft 
cheap, awful, nasty, filthy uh, watercolour te painter's tape because it's so rubbish you can get it back off again. You don't want to buy a really good quality high-tack tape. You want one that's actually a bit rubbish. And if it tells you in the storage instructions to store it in a cool, dark place, don't. Because you want the glue to perish a bit. You want it to be a little bit rubbish so that you can actually get it back off the paper. And you can do the card maker's trick of putting it on the inside of your arm and peeling it off to cover it in skin cells because that helps you to remove it as well. But I can't be bothered. So I'm going to smooth that round on all edges. Now that has made it bigger than my intended original shape. So what I'm going to have to account for when I do the real thing is the width of the tape. Because when I put that on, when I was going to put it on originally, I was only going to put a very small lip onto the paper. But this tape, with it not being very tacky, actually needs more of it on the paper than it does on the acetate. So I've now got a shape wider than I intended to have. But I can work with that. Now... I have a palette here of dried up paint from a painting I started, or a sketch, a composition I started, based on the Song of Ice and Fire, oh, I'm sorry, I've just got a squashed leg, Song of Ice and Fire series by George R. R. Martin, which got immortalised for television as a Game of Thrones. Um, I'm currently rereading them, I first read them in the 1990s, and I'm currently on Feast for Crows which I remember I didn't like the first time round, I think 10 years ago when I read, when I read it, so it's just very slow going. Um, I started coming up with a, with a composition because I wanted to paint a woodland scene on Milford, very translucent colours, and I wanted to use heavily staining colours that I can't lift easily on other papers. This being Bockingford, they're not going to lift too easily. So I'll tell you what I've got uh, and what I'm going to actually use. There's a sepia here, which I'm going to ignore. That's not uh, transparent. Green gold, a.k.a. Azo yellow, a.k.a. Ergazan yellow. Um, I love that colour. Uh, I've forgotten the name of that one. I'll come back to it. Uh, Perilene maroon, which looks like blood. Perilene Green, which is virtually black. Quinacridone Gold, which I've actually changed my mind about now, and I'm going to use Transparent Yellow instead, because this is a little bit too brown. And that blue is... It's going to annoy me for days now that I can't remember that blue, and I can't see my palette from here. Um, oh, here it is. I'm so sorry, I can't read today. <laughs> I'm having one of those days I can't read upside down. In Danthrene Blue, of course it is. I had in my head Imidazole Blue, and Imidazole is some chemical we use at work, and I'm going slightly mad here. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen. So, um, I'm going to add some water to those and start throwing some paint around, and I'm using a one-inch Proline Flat from ProArt, just because I like it, really. And I'm going to start with the um, green gold because it's pretty and I just want to get it down. Uh, and the colour that's in the middle of the palette, that neutral, is the neutral you get from mixing Perilin Maroon, the blood red, with Perilin Green. Um, they're very compatible together, they make a nice transparent neutral. So first of all, using clean water for a change, because I've just done my water, I'm going to wet the edges of the paper. Um, I don't rate proline brushes for wetting the paper. I don't think they hold enough water for really sloshing it on. And obviously that watercolour pencil that I used is now lifting, but that's not a problem because that'll get blended away into infinity. Okay, let's see what happens with this. What I really want to do is just add some foliage really on the sides where I've got a straight edge. I could actually do this without the acetate piece. I could just use a tape box and be very careful not to go on the inside of it. 
The reason I put that in there was one of the ideas I had, which I'm probably not going to do because it seemed a bit too wasteful and messy, was to um, take, if I was going to do it in the portrait morphology, what I was going to do is over the upper half of the painting where the trees would be, was just pour on some perylin green onto the acetate, let it run off onto the paper, dry it upside down so you get the kind of branches kind of effect but I could just see it being one of those things that I'd waste about 10 pieces of paper until I got it to look how I wanted it so I gave up on that idea I figured it was uh, a little bit too messy so now I'm wetting that perylene green these have been dried in my palette for about a month and they just totally re wet really easily uh, I'll link in the icons now in my video on Windsor and Newton paints and um, differences between using pans, tubes and re-wetting tube paints and you'll see that, you know, you can see how easily this is re-wetted. They do say in their marketing materials that their tube paints don't re-wet reliably. It is total bollocks. All they have to be able to say to, to say that is that in one experiment in the lab they're not quite as good. So they can be perfectly dishonest so that people will buy pans thinking they have to buy pans and tubes. But look, I don't use pans really. So um, this is working fine for me. For um, things coming up on my channel, that's just reminded me, I've actually got on order and they should be here next week. Some of the giant pans from Windsor & Newton, the porcelain pans, and I've ordered French Ultramarine, Yellow Ochre and Burnt Sienna. Because I use them a lot. I was going to buy permanent rose, quinacridone rose, but changed my mind. So I'm now using uh, perylene maroon, which, yeah, I think I'm going to have to go to the tube and get some more of that. Um, oh, there might be some in a palette here. Yeah, there's some in a palette just nearby. Let me just get some off that. I just wanted to kind of put in that gate and just sort of hint at its presence. It's going to bleed, but that's the idea. This is the bottom coat, of course. Now, I would need a brown normally um, to do the house adjacent, but I'm going to use that neutral because it's a really nice neutral. And I think this is getting dry. I think I'm going to blot that. Blotting with a microfiber cloth um, lifts off a lot of paint. So I just needed something to give a straight edge and to allude to the presence of that house. Look how lovely and dark that is. Isn't it wonderful? And there's its door. And I'll put in a window as well. This is a one stroke, by the way, that I'm using rather than a flat. Uh, if you actually know what the difference is, then well done. If you don't know what the difference is, it's not going to make much of a difference to you. I am going to do a brushes video. I've done a brushes video already, linked in the iCards, but I think I'm going to do another one because people have been asking me to do a brushes 101, even though my brushes video that's already out there is out there because people are asking what brushes should a beginner use, and the reality is you use what you like, but you use the best quality brushes you can afford. So these really god-awful pony synthetics I don't recommend for beginners. I would rather, like with paints, I think it's better if you buy six colours, warm red, warm yellow, warm blue, cool yellow, cool red, cool, cool blue, in professional, and a flat and two size rounds, and maybe a large flat, that is better than buying a whole swathe of brushes and 30 paints, honestly. You really can't go wrong with a small palette and a small number of brushes. Right. think that is most of that kind of external area done. What I'm going to do is add some more perylene green to the top 
outside of the wetted area, so the area that's just was dry paper underneath. And I'm going to apply some more water using a different brush. I'm going to use a Daylon 12 round, which is Daylon and Rowney's professional um, synthetic for watercolour use and gouache use. It's G77 is the series number. And this is the largest in the series. It's about £20 in the UK. Um, really thirsty brush. I mean, it's just drunk everything from my palette using it and I just want to use that to make it a bit more kind of tree-like with less kind of square edges because this ain't urban sketching <laughs> I do actually want it to kind of have some lifelike qualities and remember this is a sketch this is not the painting this is really just intended to show me what does and doesn't work so that I can develop it and I think I may even develop it with you guys I think over the next few weeks I may actually develop this painting as videos so you can see every stage in the process or at least some of the stages in the process because my friend ain't seeing it he'll see it when I give him the finished painting in December to give to his mother it's a bit risky actually I should give it in November because if he hates it He's got time to go and buy something else because I'm not doing it again, much as I love him. I'm not painting it twice. Um, I think I'm going to add a little bit of quinacridone gold, which is this sort of orangey colour. It's the Winsor & Newton one, so it's the fake quinacridone gold because they can't get the pigment anymore. Um, not many people know this, but um, artists' pigments are all actually pigments used, pretty much, in painting of either cars, buildings or decorating of homes. And as soon as the decorating industry or the car industry stops bothering to use a particular pigment, we can't get it anymore as painters because there's just not enough of us using things to drive the market. And if you think about it, a 5 mil tube of paint probably contains about less than half a gram to a gram of pigment. One of those tubes could last me five years. So there's just not enough of even people like me who paint daily uh, to drive that market so once it's gone it's gone and daniel smith are proudly advertising they've got the last of it in the world which i don't really believe um but it will be gone soon they are going to run out at some point but so if you are in um in a shop and you see quinacridone gold in old packaging from any manufacturer if it's got a PO pigment number on it rather than two or three pigment numbers, buy it because it's the original recipe and it's really good stuff. I'm going to use a little bit of sepia now, which I said I wasn't going to do, just because I'm curious to see. I used a shadow colour on that side and I'm going to use sepia on this side just to see what difference I get. Because this side's a gate, remember. This side's not a house, it's a red gate. I don't know whether I can allude to the gate stripes. I'll let that bleed in and see what it does. Use a little bit more of that shadow colour to just emphasise that edge a little bit more. And playing. I'm not trying to make a painting here. What I'm trying to do is try out a load of techniques, roughly in the shape of my intended building, and kind of see what happens. Yeah, that's better. It's not a pure red, you see. It's a sort of iron red but I don't want to use an iron red because it won't be transparent. So I'm using perylene maroon mixed with a little bit of sepia to granulate it. And I'll move it so you can see it because you realise you can't really see that side at all, can you? So there we have this gate in perylene maroon glazed with sepia. So we get quite a nice effect there. Now what I'm going to need to do now is let this dry. Some of the properties I like of it so far that I will talk to you about are uh, where the door over here of this house has bled up into the window so you've got this kind of like a dream of a house next door this is not a house this is just kind of like a dream of a house it's just sort of slightly suggests it um and what my intention to do was when i paint the actual house itself here i will paint it more literally i will paint it in detail with window boxes and flowers cascading but keep the house background as white as i can without adding any shadows because these areas give me that texture. I think I'm going to paint across the bottom because I think having some 
texture at the bottom is going to help give the house some grounding otherwise it might I don't know part of me wants to leave it so the house bleeds into the floor and the, the door kind of reflects away into the floor so what I think I might do is slap a load of water on the bottom and I know that their door is blue so if I were to imagine where I would paint the door if I reflect it away and let that bleed and I also add a line of it across when that's dry I can paint a solid literal door above here and it'll be like a reflection it's a nice little technique for getting reflections another one is sorry you can't see that very well so I painted that kind of where the door would be reflection another way to do it is you actually paint in all the shapes you intend to paint you paint the door and then you wet the area underneath the door and hold it vertical so that the door kind of bleeds away into the area underneath and then you paint the door in itself properly later when it's dry and you see that if you look on Lindsay the Frugal Crafter's channel I have not got a clue what she called the painting but she has this brilliant coloured painting where she uses um I don't know what it is, it's like a cobalt blue, I think a quinacridone rose and a gamboge together to paint this building in Italy in three colours and it's the most wonderful, dreamlike, beautiful, wonderful piece of art at the end that came from a really boring photograph that she found on Paint My Photo that she just livened up by using crazy colours and that technique she uses there to give this kind of false reflection um, which makes it look like it's above a river, whereas in reality it's just on a tarmac street. So it does add a lot of interest. So I'm going to let this dry out now, and then I'm going to come back and film some more. Okay, welcome back. I've given it about 15 minutes, and I've already removed the acetate. I've just moved you because I wanted you to be more above, so you can see a bit more clearly. When I was removing the acetate, a little bit of green came through here and here, and I'm going to lift that, so I'll show you how I'll do that. I'm going to use a Kalinsky quarter-inch one-stroke, just because it's really thirsty and should make lifting easy. And this is Bockingford. It won't lift brilliantly. These are really staining colours, so I'm just going to paint over it. You shouldn't really scrub with Kalinsky brushes because it knackers them, and I don't like knackering real hair brushes because that means another animal has to die to make another brush, so I think... We have a duty, those of us who use real hair brushes, to really respect the brushes, make them last as long as we can. Um, it's like eating meat. I won't throw meat away. Um, I have to eat it because then the animal died for no reason and I can't handle that. So I am very careful. So I'm just drying the brush off, off camera. And I'm now going to lift up that water. It doesn't lift very well because... It's perylene green, and perylene green stains like buggery. So there we go. Oh, first swear word of the day. I did pretty well, though. Half an hour with no swearing. That is pretty good going. I will say, I'm going to get a second one. Well, slight swear word, I don't know. Um, we've got, coming in off the... Um, I live right in the southwest of the UK, right on the border of Devon and Cornwall, and I'm a couple of metres from the sea, and we have got... A really strong storm has been coming in all day. It's been pouring with rain. And I'm right kind of in the area where if you go hundreds of miles out into the water, you, we're actually just beyond the English Channel and kind of in the Atlantic Ocean. So we've got this really hot air coming in off the sea with pouring rain. So I am absolutely soaking wet. I'm sweating like a glass blower's arse, as we say in the UK, because it is so humid here. So I'm struggling a little bit because sweat's pouring off of me, literally dripping off of me, and I'm trying not to let it get on the painting. But there we go. So what I'm going to do now is I want to soften this hard line around the edge because I think it's too much. It won't soften very well because I'm using staining colours, but I want to soften it just a little bit because it's a little bit too strong. So what I'm doing is I'm just touching in from the outside edge just to bring some paint onto it. And then what I'm going to do is use my round to paint water adjacent to the edge of where I've just brought the paint on. And what will happen is I basically diffused paint into water and then I'm adding more water so it will get really dilute and that will give us a nice faded edge eventually.
I'm going to have to clean some of it up because the water's a bit grubby now, so. And I like to use a flat for this, or a one-stroke, really, because it's strong enough to get a really sharp edge, and that's so important. One thing I do find with these day-long rounds is they're lovely, but they are a bugger to clean. Sometimes they just want to hold on to the paint a bit too much, so you get this grubby kind of looking water coming out of them, even after you've scrubbed and scrubbed the bottom of the jar of water to clean them. And I'm not worrying where I spill water, because you know, it's not the end of the world. I'm not softening the right hand edge as much, because A, I want to see if it looks very different, and B, I kind of like the idea that the light's coming so that there's a shadow on that side. That's how I'm kind of viewing this at the moment. And what I'm going to do now is dry this one stroke. I keep calling it flat, sorry. One strokes were sign writing brushes once upon a time, but they got appropriated by watercolorists. And I just want to use this dry to just lift out some of that water. So I am going to get a grubby edge. I'm not going to get a soft edge. I'm going to get a soft err but there will still be a line edge i could go all the way across if i wanted to and really soften it but i like the idea of having that white um my friend's family are scandinavian they came over from denmark when he was I don't know, seven i guess and and i've known him over 10 years now i actually taught him um actually was a former student of mine who i stayed in touch with because that's what often happens i taught him for two and a half years I think so then people stay in touch with you if they do research in your laboratory and he's become a very good friend over the years as sometimes happens don't tend to deal personally with former students till they've been gone about four or five years really that's the point where I would add them on Facebook if they invited me but I would never add a student on Facebook because I've got photos of me drunk in the 1990s that no one needs to see so I'm just wiping out some of that water with my microfiber there just to tidy it up. I've got a little bit of a stain here and here, but I'm not going to worry about that. What I now want to do is add that door and window that I added over here, where I added them as a blue shadow. I want to make them a little bit less hard. I'm going to use the same technique, though. I am going to use a one-stroke. Um, but I want the door on this side to be more literal, so I'm going to be painting wet on dry with my one stroke here and I'm going to paint just above where I made the shadow of the door and it's important to me that it stops on a hard line and it isn't perfect because it has this slight bend at the bottom but I'm going to try and rescue it and it's going to go wrong but you know and what I love about indanthrene blue is that wonderful transparency. And if you can see that, you get this lovely transparent blue. I'll just get focus on there for you. There you go. It's a lovely alternative to ultramarine if you want a warm but very staining blue. There's no granulation here. This is a dye. It's not a mineral at all. So it gets deep into the paper and it stains like mad. You can't get it out. I've left it so that there is a hard area at the top because that will give the impression of the ledge above the door. I now want to add the windows and I think I'm going to do a very soft uh, glaze, I guess. Or it's not really a glaze because I'm not glazing over anything. Using indanthrene blue and I'm going to dilute it right down by diluting it in one well of my palette, soaking up a brushful into the next well and adding more water so that I've got a really diluted version of it. And I'm just going to sort of paint approximate windows. Not quite based on the sketch, but sod it. This is a test of technique. This is not a um, painting. This is just to see if the style I want to paint in actually works for me. I want something very vibrant. I know my friend's mother, and I know she would like a really vibrant image. Now I'm going to go into the slightly darker, and I'm going to put some shadow by just touching. And that's what's nice about a one stroke is that you can touch it and get a sharp line, and then let that bleed across, and that will give you 
quite a nice shadow, but you've got to do it while it's still wet because you get a back run otherwise. I mean, that's what I love about the one stroke. You see, you get that almost razor like edge, it's wonderful. And now the roof of the building, which in real life is brown. Um, I could make a brown here. I think I'm going to put a little bit of that neutral that I made, which is the red green mix. Add some quin orange to that. Now, hang on, quin gold isn't orange. So let's think about the colour wheel a moment. The complement of green is red. The complement of yellow is purple. Therefore, the complement of orange is blue. So if I add some quin gold over here and I add to it some of this indanthrene blue, I should be able to get a decent, there we go, sludgy muddy colour. If I, if I add more, I'll get a perfect, a near perfect black, but that's not what I want. So I want that diluted down now, that's too strong. It is a little bit green, but that's not really the end of the world. I can add a bit of red to it. Just knock out that green tone and make it a little bit more brown. And I'm painting this interior of the house entirely wet on dry. There, there's no kind of blending and soft colours. What I was interested to see is, can I use dark intensity outside the house and soft ghost-likeness on the inside, or do I have to do it with an intense house and a ghost-like background? I think I'm probably going to end up doing a softer background and a more intense house, but I just wanted to see what happened if I tried this, because I still experiment. I like to try new techniques. Um, I want to add a lot of colour to this, ultimately. I'm using a bit of sepia now to define the bottoms of these windows and let it bleed upwards and that's going to become the back of some plants there's going to be some window box plants but I want to let that bleed up because sepia being a granulating colour because it's fake sepia it's not squid ink um, will kind of channel and river delta up the paper and oh dear you're out of focus I'm sorry you've been like that for ages um, it's kind of like a river delta effect, and then I'm going to use that as the shadow for the plants. The plants will sit in front of it. I'm now moving to a size 4 Kalinsky. Same one I used for the ink tents painting, and I'm using it reasonably dry with the perylene green. Good thing with painting wet and dry is it dries really fast. So I've painted outside the realms of the window and over the window. I'm not going to do the other two because they're still too wet to do it. But I'm going to need a little bit of sepia to be the actual window box. And then we've got the plants. And I'll just add some drops of colour. A little bit of green gold, a bit of variety there, a bit of quin gold, and some perylin maroon, that blood colour. And if you can just make that out, you get this dreamlike window box where the colours are just sort of hinted at. And what I think I'm likely to do in the... Um, finished version is I might use that technique for the adjacent houses and do a more literal version of their house. So that's the importance of playing really and of sketching and trying different techniques is that you learn what's right for the subject and some subjects lend themselves to some techniques better than others do and there's nothing wrong with that. I could not paint this house because it's a former home and so on as a photorealistic image because then a what's the point what's the point in photorealism in watercolor come on watercolor lends itself to impressionism and blurry soft images so i don't want to do that i want to 
have a slightly more abstract image. And I want it to be dreamlike because it's in the past. Something in someone's past, I think, works well as a sort of soft, muted image. And that say a sepia used really pale actually is quite nice there. So I think lesson learned on the sepia front, use it really dilute because you get a translucency, which is really nice to have. Completely balls it up at the bottom. I don't know, wonky window box, but who cares? It's not a painting. It's a study and I can do what the hell I like. And at the end of the day, I'm not wasting paint here. These are leftovers from another painting. That other painting, incidentally, got as far as sketchbook and a couple of different iterations, but it never made it to a final painting yet because the idea that I had didn't quite work. To explain, um, Mind of Watercolour, who I think is brilliant, uh, did a wisteria kind of masking fluid uh, video, a video about masking fluid, and he painted some wisteria binds. They're not vines on a wisteria, they're called binds, B-I-N-E-S. And um, Bravo India November Echo Sierra, realised I didn't say it very clearly, and, and he had them all sort of twisting up, and I was thinking about the um, the weirwood trees in, in A Song of Ice and Fire, and they're said to have leaves and sap the colour of blood. So I thought, well, Perilyn Maroon. I just bought some Perilyn Maroon. And I thought, right, I want to use it. I want to do a weirwood tree. So what I came up with was rather than doing it the way they're shown on the TV show, because we don't really know a lot about them in the books. We know that they're white. They have white bark and these blood red leaves. So I thought I could do like binds like a wisteria with these blood red leaves coming down. So I had the idea to pour over again to do the red as a pour over and then have the binds masked out but I tried different versions of it and painting wise it worked but compositionally it was hard so getting the composition right was the tricky part and I still haven't got it to a stage where I want to waste a sheet of paper on it just yet so over that area I painted in with that translucent brown I did earlier I'm going to throw on some sepia along one end and take it out just to see how it looks. I kind of got the light coming down this way a little bit, so this side has got slightly more shadow than this side. I'm not going to add any detail to the background at all. Um, the background is what it is, it's just a sort of an echo that the house sits within. And on the whole, I mean, it's a crap painting because it's got wobbly edges. I mean, I've spent, what, 30 minutes on this, 40 minutes on this at most. I would spend a lot longer on this if I was doing it for real and I would do it in stages. So I would have done like the pour over of the green or whatever, let it dry overnight. I would have done the gate, let it dry overnight. And then I would have probably spent a day doing a window and then breaking for a few hours and doing a window because that's the way I like to do it. I like to have lots of gaps but the idea of keeping the paint, the paper absolutely white has actually worked quite nicely. But I do want to try another way of doing it. So let me just show it to you and then we'll have a think. So obviously it's still wet, but you can see that kind of roof there. Dreamlike windows and then the door with its reflection fading away. But you can see this is pristine white paper. No shadows, no shading, but I think it works. Now, in reality, these windows would have frames on them and they would have um, curtains behind them, which I would need to add if I was going to do it more literally, but we'll see. What I'm curious about is how this house would work if I did a wash of a really, really, really light um, blue. So, you know, as a shadow to add texture. So I'm going to try that on... Um, some other paper. I'm just seeing if I've got any scraps around of um, Bockingford or of similar paper. Uh, this is the back of a Bockingford disaster. We'll use that. I just want to try it out really. I'm just curious if you um, shade a box by Filling in, I'm just going to fill in a square, wetted, and then apply it as a shadow 
along one edge, the endanthrene blue, and along the bottom. And then using that really pale mix, I'm just going to extend those lines out. So you've still got the shaded area. I probably would not do this with blue actually for the house. I would probably do it with a very pale green because that would reflect the trees. So what I'm thinking actually is rather than having this pristine white is maybe do a green gold really very fine wash on the whole page first then mask that area off. So let's have a look at how that would look. A really fine wash of green gold, really thin, very, very little to it. I do like when I use a large brush, I have a tendency to hold it on the ferrule like an extension of my hand rather than like a brush. I find I can be more aggressive when I do that. And just for the sake of fun, I'm just going to throw in a little drop of perylene, maroon, perylene green along one edge just to see how that looks when it's dry. It's not intended as a proper colour test. So you can see there, really, really light green and then just a hint of shadow. And I think actually that might be what I'm looking for because that white on its own actually looks pretty harsh. It works in that the negative space idea really works, but I think I can't... What I had in my mind was a pristine white would work, but it's too clinical. So I think I'm going to wash the whole page in a very, very, very pale yellow green to reflect the trees on the other side of the street in my imagined version of their street. It's actually brown houses on the opposite side. Then paint in the wet on wet around the edge. So I may only actually sort of paint the middle, dry it, then do the wet on wet around the edges. And I think when I do that, I almost want to reverse what I did. So where I've got these very literal door with the dreamlight reflection, but the windows are really murky, I think the windows of the adjacent house should be like this. And the windows of this house should be painted in literally with fine lines, curtains and everything else. So that's taught me a few techniques that I'm probably going to use, which colours work well. Like I love where the Perlin red the quin gold, the green gold, and the green kind of merge to make that, you know, we know, because we're, we're used to the house, we know there's a gate there. If you look at it knowing the house, you know that that's a gate, even though you can't see a gate in reality. And to remind you how the original kind of looked, it was a gate there, a red gate, so it kind of works. So I'm going to come to the end now, because I don't like these videos to really get more than an hour. That is The Spin Doctor Sits and Composes, part one. Um, I might call it Spin Doctor Sits and Composes, a Christmas present, maybe? Don't know. Um, but there it is. So um, I'm probably going to be doing some more videos coming up soon. I've had some audio problems, which you may have seen in another couple of videos. I know what caused them. Thank you to all the people who told me they thought it was a mobile phone. It was not a mobile phone. It was a problem with some software on my computer when I was importing and compressing the videos that was causing interference because it kept popping up and doing things like a virus checking kind of thing. But I've solved it, so future videos won't have that. Um, just to show you what else I've been painting while we're sat here, I started this um, kind of cave painting style mountain. I started it ages ago actually and I stopped. And what I want to do is paint the whole painting in uh, red, reddish browns and yellowy browns and let me take you out the tripod and show you. So you can see here the sky is white, brown and then this dark grey which is actually Jane's grey. It's um, French ultramarine and burnt sienna but very very dark and intense mixed with cobalt blue and cad orange and I think I put some yellow ochre or Naples yellow in it. There's no blue visible. There's blue in there. There's ultramarine and cobalt blue in the mix, but no visible blue. And what I liked was the idea of doing this whole thing in the colours of cave paintings, just so that there's no normal colours. It's just neutrals, really. See how it goes. Just doing it for fun. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye.